What is going on everybody, it's the Frost, and we are for a Monday Night Raw review for last night's episode of Monday Night Raw, which is now live from the PC in Florida, as the governor of Florida has deemed any, any type of athletic sport that has national, worldwide um, viewing essential. WWE, AEW, UFC, NBA, MLB, NHL. All those are essential to the Florida's economy. So everything we could be seeing, if the if the other sports that should be going on right now want to, Florida said you are open for us to use now. But WWE was the first, and now if AEW wants to go back to Jacksonville and Dally's place, more power to them. Now, we start off the show, we see a replay of Drew McIntyre beating Brock Lesnar. We go to the ring, and here it comes, and out comes Drew McIntyre. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Jerry the King Lawler is back on Monday Night Raw. He has been gone since week two, I believe, of this entire thing, um, close set that they have been doing. It's only been Byron Saxon and Tom Phillips, which, I'm going to be honest, Byron Saxon and Tom Phillips on their own is way better than it should be. Byron Saxon usually is the annoying one of a three-man group. With him and by him and Tom Phillips, for some reason, it just seems to work a hell of a lot better than anything else. But no, they brought Jerry the King Lawler back. I know King wants to work and whatever. But I just, I cannot stand the King. And we'll get into something he says during a match later on that was way out of line, racist as hell, and should not have been said. But anyway. King starts right off and says, Drew McIntyre's win over Brock Lesnar isn't just the biggest in his career, but it's the biggest win in WWE history of all time. Are you kidding me? Yes, Drew McIntyre beating Brock Lesnar was a big for, for Drew McIntyre's career, but it's not the biggest win of all time. Brock Lesnar beating The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30 is the biggest win in WWE history because up until that time, nobody thought the streak was going to ever be broken. We all figured Undertaker would raise, after winning a WrestleMania match, would raise that fist, go down like he did at WrestleMania 32, and be like, I am retired. That did not happen, of course. And here we are. Undertaker is the American Badass again. We'll talk about that on Saturday because he weighed in on how easy it was to transition into the American Badass with his feud with AJ Styles. But anyway, no, this is not the biggest win in WWE history. Beating Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania is not as big of a deal as it was eight years ago. Having Goldberg squash Brock Lesnar at, at Survivor Series in 2016 did more damage to the, the what is it called, the important, like beating Brock Lesnar, anyone else beating Brock Lesnar, than anything else that has happened. Or Brock Lesnar. Yes, him losing to Triple H at WrestleMania, and I believe the feud overall between him and Triple H. That's one thing. But that was we that was recon when he beat the streak. And then he went on this tear. He destroyed John Cena at, at SummerSlam later in that year. And just looked like this unstoppable beast. And then you took Brock Lesnar and took him against Goldberg at Survivor Series in 2016 and had Goldberg beat him in a minute, six seconds. Or 40, like less than a minute, if anything. Why? How is Brock Lesnar winning, losing, beating Brock Lesnar mean anything after that? But Drew thanks the fans for allowing us into our, allowing him into our living room, and thanks for the outpour of support. Notes that the internet, you know, times can be negative, but it's all been support. Everyone's just happy the fact that he is your WWE champion. Says it's his lifelong dream to be WWE champion and also beating Brock Lesnar in under five minutes. And he says what they want to say was 20 minutes later, which I call BS. There's no way that was 20 minutes later. The dude looks like he came out last week for that interview, which turned into a match with the Big Show. It looked like it's been at least a couple hours, maybe even a day in between the matches. But okay, 20 minutes, whatever. He shows us the match with the Big Show. He commentates and what he was thinking, what he was going through during the entire time. He beat Brock Lesnar and Big Show back to back. Hold on. 
my hit, hit my notes away. Uh, they beat Big Show and him back to back. And he says to anyone in the back, if you deserve a shot at the title, you get a shot at the title. He goes to talk a little bit more and out comes Andrade and Zelina Vega. Vega introduces Andrade to Drew McIntyre, calls him the real champion of Raw. And Drew says the crowd goes mild. Ha 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 ha, I see what you did there, Drew. But Drew's like, I, I, know who, I know who Andrade is. And Vega's like, oh, how can I forget? How can I forget that the last time you were in the ring with this guy, he was hitting you with a DDT, a hammerlock DDT off the top rope, and ripping your bicep open. That's exactly what happened. Now, she they just wanted to congratulate Drew for winning the title and having two WrestleMania moments in the same night. But she mentions how her associate, her associate didn't get a WrestleMania moment because he ended up having to miss WrestleMania because of a rib injury. And let's see. Vega says, it's, it'd be a shame if someone injured you and took that title from you, referencing to what happened at TakeOver, uh, TakeOver War Games, the first ever TakeOver War Games, where it was Drew McIntyre versus Andrade for the, U for the NXT Championship, and he got injured, and the Matt title was taken away from him in one night. Drew says, you know what, I'm not here, I know you don't talk much, Andrade, but if you want this match, you want champion versus champion tonight, you got it. Andrade says in his best broken English that last time I took your title and I took you out. And Angelina adds, for six months. And tonight, I'll do it again and no more Drew. Now this was a hell of a way to start this show. This was great. Drew McIntyre is a very believable champion. He's definitely going to be one hell of a champion. I hope he keeps the title for until at least SummerSlam. Or going into Survivor Series, it would not be. I would not mind if he is a champion for the rest of the year. If he kept the title and lost it, maybe at like the Royal Rumble or at the Elimination Chamber. Or hell, if he held it to WrestleMania 32, which would be less than a year because it is going to be in March next year, I would not be mad one bit. I think if they book him right, Drew McIntyre could be the best WWE champion we've had in 10 years. The money, front, money in the Bank qualifiers for the night, Oscar versus Ruby Riot, Shannon Baszler versus Sarah Logan, and unfortunately, Nia Jax versus Kyrie Sane. I feel bad for Kyrie Sane. I happened to put over a, a, a 300-pound tub of lard. It, we we heard from Becky later in the night, and it did, they did confirm that it would be Dream McIntyre versus Andrade in the main event. Now, it is Oscar versus Ruby Riot, and I'm just going to say this now. I hate... The fact that Tom Phillips, he did confirm that the winner of the Money in the Bank ladder match, it will be three from Raw, three from SmackDown in both matches. If you wanted to do four from four and do eight men, eight team people, eight, 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 eight person ladder match, I have no problem with that. But WWE needs to stop having the Money in the Bank ladder match just be the winner gets to go after their championship. Anytime, any at any time during for one year, I want to see somebody win the Money in the Bank and get a shot at either the WWE or Universal Champion for the next year. It makes it more unpredictable. And the only time that you're gonna, the only time that you would probably see somebody from Raw go to SmackDown and challenge for the Universal Title is doing a pay per view. So. I think they need to change that. I think it would be a lot better if you would allow them to say, like, hey, say, Oscar versus Ruby Riot. Oscar wins this match, and then she goes on to win the Money in the Bank. She can go after Bailey or Bailey or um, Becky Lynch. Now, Becky Lynch, she's even she's she's like traded wins with, but Bailey, she's beaten Bailey twice in NXT, and they've never really had a match on the main roster, so. That would be an interesting little way to set up a feud there. Oscar, who is a heel, of course, probably wouldn't do that, but Oscar beats Bailey for the Women's Championship and then goes over the SmackDown and continues to feud with Bailey. I think that would be fantastic. Now, Oscar comes out first, 
Then Ruby Riot comes out. But while Ruby Riot is coming out, Oscar is literally sitting there in uh, standing in the ring, dancing to Ruby Riot's music. This woman just does whatever she can to try and entertain, and it's funny. It's fun. If that's what Oscar wants to do, she wants to just sit there and be a dancing fool for a minute. That it is what it is. So this match was went way too long. The difference between this match and the other two money in the bank qualifiers is the other two money in the bank qualifiers were short, sweet, and to the point. The person they wanted to put over got over, got done with the match and over with, and this one went too long. Ruby gets the headlock on Oscar, but Oscar shorter block doesn't phase Oscar whatsoever. Oscar's some eating some shots on from Ruby until Oscar goes for a clothesline. Ruby ducks it and takes her down with her own clothesline. Ruby goes for the pin, gets a one count. Ruby is showing Oscar, shoving Oscar in the face. And she's like, "What are you like?" She's saying, "She's like, what are you doing? I want the real Oscar. Where's the real Oscar? That's who I want." Oscar gets up and just grabs her left arm. And just yanks at it, starts working on it. She puts her in, uh, with an, uh, in an arm lock. She is just tearing the hell out of Ruby Riot's arm. Now Oscar touches Ruby in the car and she's shoving back at her, saying stuff in Japanese that I have no idea what the hell she's saying. Looks to use her legs to pull, um, but she like she goes to charge Ruby. Ruby hits her back elbow. And then Ruby tries to jump up and use her legs to pull Oscar into her or pull, do whatever she's going to do with her. But Oscar stops that, lifts her up, and hits her with a big knee. Oscar blocks that, lands a huge knee, and then she puts her on. And then she has her in the corner. She takes her boot and shoves it into the throat of Ruby Riot, just using the full five count as much as she can. Oscar is dominating Ruby for a bit, for a good bit, and then later in the match, Ruby tries to fight back, but Oscar yanks her down and stomps away. Oscar misses a hip attack on the rope, and Ruby connects with a kick in the gut, which rocks Oscar, and then she kicks Oscar again, knocking her to the outside. She brings her back in. Ruby gets a pin for the two count. Ruby now getting a dominant Oscar for a moment, but Oscar catches her. Big four to Ruby. Both women are down. Now they're trading shots. Ruby with a bad looking... I, I don't know what this was. She got up behind her as Oscar's on her, on her knees. And... Ruby comes from behind and tries to do this running like forearm shot. But she like catches her and pulls her in with her and then rolls her up for a pin. I have no idea what the hell was going on there, but she gets a two count. Oscar goes for the arm bar. Ruby gets a pin attempt on that for a two. Then goes for the right kick. Oscar turns it into an ankle mark. She slams right down, hits a shining wizard, which looked devastating. But Ruby kicks at it too. Oscar goes for the Oscar lock. But Riot backs her into the turnbuckle and then some knee shots to Oscar, then a running knee, running kick. And then a few running kicks, Riot with a running clothesline again for a two count. No rain again? Mm. Ruby goes for the coffin drop out of nowhere, or her version of the coffin drop. Misses. Oscar tries for the, um, for the Oscar lock. Ruby reverses that into a two count. Oscar was pissed now. Ruby continues to count her into a flat liner for a two count, then it brings a Saturn multiple pin attempts, ends with Oscar putting in the Oscar lock, and she gets to tap out. Oscar moves on to Money in the Bank. This, of course, would be Oscar's first Money in the Bank, apparently, which, uh, yeah, I guess it is. Because the first Money, the second Money in the Bank pay per view, Oscar tried to take on uh, Carmella and ended up getting. Ended up getting distracted by James Ellsworth. Remember that? Match went way too long. I think they could have did a little bit less and the match would have felt a little bit better. It just felt like there was they were trying to stretch it out. This is live now. This isn't something that's pre-taped where they can cut it up the way they want it to be. I just felt like with the other ones going shorter, both of them, that this this match could have went a little bit shorter as well. But then they would have had a little bit extra time left. After the match, Charlie Crusoe tries to interview Oscar, and the only thing I can make out is her pointing up to the briefcase, and she's saying, nobody's ready for Oscar. Then we go to the back, and MVP is in his VIP lounge. Says, next week we're going to have some his historicness to next week, as we'll have three Money in the Bank um, qualifiers, but it's going to be three first-time matches. Rey Mysterio versus Murphy. Would be a hell, if you give these guys 15 to 20 minutes, that would be a fantastic opening match to next week's show. 
plain and simple. Murphy, Ray Mysterio, give them 20 minutes. That'd be great. Of course, that means commercials, so about 15 minutes for us to see. Alistair Black vs. Austin Theory. This one... Mmm. Mmm. This one's gonna be a hard one to steal. This one could be a good one, too. Austin Theory vs. Alistair Black. Who do you have win this one? That one's gonna be, like, one of those ones that could be a fantastic match if they give it the opportunity that it could be. Austin Theory, of course, is still young, only 22 years old. They reminded you a couple times on in his match in a bit. But Alistair Black versus Austin Theory. Give Black the win or go with, with um, Austin Theory. Here's the thing. If Austin Theory was to win against Alistair Black next week, then no doubt in my mind he needs to win Money in the Bank just so you can show that, hey, we're going for this guy here. Which is why I don't think he's going to win. And then he names Apollo Crews will be going up against MVP. Remember a couple, the week after, the night after the wrestle, after the Royal Rumble when MVP wrestled Rey Mysterio and then he went on Twitter that night and was like, that was my last match on Monday Night Raw. Remember that? Remember how this guy was going to be retiring, he was retiring to be a producer backstage. I guess that was bullshit because MVP versus Alistair Black, uh, versus Apollo Crews next week. Tag me with a spoon, I don't even care. Alistair Black versus Oni Lorcan. This match did. There was nothing that happened in this match. For the first. This match had nothing going on except for them trying to wrestle, like, wrestle control for the majority of this match. And yes, we got a half Boston Crab by Oni Lorcan. They started trading shots in the back. Lorcan chops Black, but Black with a knee to the face. Black Mass, one, two, three, and that was that. There was nothing in this match worth talking about. It just, I don't know what it was. It's just the way these guys went. Nothing happened. Big shot by Lorcan, pissed off Alistair Black. Alistair Black hit a knee, and then he hits the um, Black Mass for the one, two, three. That's basically the match. Becky is out. She said it's only been a couple of weeks since she stood here at WrestleMania. Can somebody please remind Becky that WrestleMania was last week, even though I know it was taped a couple weeks ago? It aired last week. Why in the hell did you have Becky Lynch go out there? I, I just hate that. I just hate that. They do, they do this when it's live, too. When something happened a week ago, it's a couple weeks ago. Give me a damn break. Like, come on. But she says... I, I know I had a slim chance, but as, sh as shocked as Shayna was, I still beat her, and I did. Now, Shayna, I said it would be heart versus skill, but actually this was a battle of the mind. A lot has been said, maybe I'm arrogant, maybe I let you think, I think, and maybe let, let you think that maybe it got, got to your head. Maybe I use that to, to use that to yours, uh, use that, I messed my notes up here. The quicker you destroyed everyone to, man to get to Mania, the sillier I became. Why? That's because the Joker is the only one who can, come, who can get close to the Queen without looking like a threat, and that's why I'm the champ. Someone born to be a bully will never be able to beat someone born to survive every day. Uh, okay. This entire short promo was terrible, by the way. This brings me to Money in the Bank. I'm here to challenge whoever wants this the most. And use that contract and name a time and a place to use it. And I will be there waiting to shock the world again. Byron called this the most intelligent thing Becky has said. Using, like, just, just like, the promo itself was just so bad. Becky Lynch had this coolness to her a year ago. She just had this, like, she was the best thing on WWE television by a country mile to anything else. And man, has she cooled off. A fact that she wanted to just do a, like a parody of Conor McGregor and just wanted to, you know, mindfuck um, Shayna Baszler at, in the WrestleMania. And then she wins by a fluke roll-up that made, that made Shayna Baszler look stupid in the end because it's not the first time Shayna Baszler had been beat by that exact same move. Give me a break. 
Charlie's backstage with Johnny and Vega asking another dumb question. Vega asks a great question to Charlie, though. It's like, who the hell comes up with these questions for Charlie? Because, honestly, it's not Charlie. Obviously, that answer is Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon comes up with these questions for Charlie to ask the heels, which are insulting, stupid, and if I was a heel, I wouldn't want to answer them. He says, on, she called, and this is another thing. She called Andrade a dominating champion in this entire promo that they were doing backstage. Saying he's defended his title month after month after month about against the greatest WWE has to offer. Andrade has faced four, two people. Rey Mysterio and Humberto Clario. That is it. That is it. He has not faced anybody else. So you're gonna sit there and tell me that Andrade is the most is a dominant champion when he's been facing the same two guys month after month after month after month. Not really a dominant champion. Now that this whole entire pandemic thing's been going on and Andrade's got a chance to get away from him, but the career and Rey Mysterio, hopefully he can be shown to be defending the title against literally anybody else. Bill Logan versus Shayna Baszler. I said I feel bad for Kyrie Sane because of who she had to put over. I feel bad for Shayna and Sarah Logan having to even go out there and take this punishment. So, Shabba, now that's the thing. Sarah Logan's out in the ring. We see Shayna Baszler in the back. She looks pissed off. She looks just like, just like ready to go out there and kill whoever is in front of her. Of course, the night with the last night was Sarah Logan. Sarah Shabba comes over and is like, we know you're friends with, with um, Ronda Rousey. What are your thoughts on the comment, the, the, the disparaging remarks she has made recently? Do you care to comment? Shayna Baszler looks her down, dead in the eyes and like looks dead down the camera or dead at her and uh, daggers and doesn't give a shit and just walks out. So Shayna Baszler was pissed off already. Why the hell would you go over there and piss her off even more? This made, this, I know that like, people like, oh, it's a work now because Ronda Rousey has been mentioned. Honestly, I don't want it to be a work. I want Ronda Rousey to never come back because she's disrespectful to the business. She doesn't, she never, she never paid her dues. He thinks just because she had a sham of a run in the UFC facing people that, like, not even facing real talented women uh, and defended her title multiple times against women who just, didn't have any business in the octagon and she comes up against one real fighter who beats her ass and wants to contemplate suicide we should feel sympathetic sympath sympathy for her give me a break but moving on to the match they lock up Razor hits a huge form and then she gets down for the ground and pound and she just starts brutalizing this woman so logan had no chance but Shannon Baszler beats the living piss out of her. She continues to brutalize her until the referee finally pulls her off, checks on, Shane, on Sarah Logan. While that's happening, Sarah Logan's arm just so happens to be in the, in the position that Shannon Baszler likes to stomp on somebody's arm. She comes over and either stomps on it or kicks it so hard that it goes forward. And all you hear is the agonizing scream from Sarah Logan. Referee calls the match, and then Mike Rome, for some fucking reason, says the winner of the match, Sarah Logan. The referee can rang the bell, because Sarah Logan couldn't continue. And for whatever reason, Mike Rome thought that was a disqualification. No, that was a referee stoppage. Sarah Logan did not make it through, it was Shayna Baszler. I don't know what Mike Rome was thinking there, but when the referee called for the bell there, it wasn't a DQ, it was a referee stoppage. You had Byron Saxon, Mike, um, Byron Saxon, Jerry the King Lawler, and Tom Phillips like, that, there must be some kind of misunderstanding here, because shouldn't Shayna Baszler be the one moving on? So we went, like, they went to commercial break. Before they went to commercial break, we went back to Seth, who says, at WrestleMania, 
as he's just staring dead into he's not even staring into the camera he's just staring dead off into this distance at wrestlemania i lost to kevin owens once again my career has been crucified and seen and we go to commercial break so Seth Rollins is going down the nut route. He is starting to lose his mind. Commentary did confirm that Baze was the actual winner, and then we go to Eric Kertazawa versus Austin Theory with Elena Vega on commentary. Theory, of course, is officially on Monday Night Raw and is a part of the group with Elena Vega. Vega. So, looking at all this, you have Andrade, Angel Garza, and Austin Theory with Zelina Vega. I'm going to tell you right now that that just looks beautiful as a team, as a group. You have three guys who could be the literal future of this company. This could be a new shield. This could be a new anything. This is WWE's take on the Ingobernables factions in, LA, in New Japan, in Ring of Honor, in CMLL. There's... In Ingobernables, which is in CMLL, you have LIJ, Ingobernables, um, Ingobernables de Hopon in um, New Japan, and then there's Familia Ingobernables, and I think it's some, I don't remember what it's actually called, in Ring of Honor with Roosh, Dragon Lee, or Ryu Lee, and uh, Kenny King, I believe. This is WWE's Ingobernables. It's not going to be the name they use, because, yes. I know that Andrade was from the original faction in CMLL. I don't know if Angel Garza was, but I know Andrade was. So maybe this is their version of that faction. Which is great, because these three guys, like Andrade and Angel Garza, are there to help get Theory up to where he needs to be for the main roster. There is no way on his own this guy right now would be able to stand on his own two feet in WWE and actually be able to have a fighting chance. Vince McMahon would drop him fast. But. Now. This match was okay. They really had the offense from the beginning. But towards the, towards the tail end of the match. Akira Tozawa. Takes a running cannonball. Sunset flip. Off of the stairs. He's still on the outside. Jerry the King Lawler. Decides to call this the ramen noodle moonsault. That is racist as hell. There is no reason a 70 plus year old Jerry the King Lawler needs to be on commentary. People could say that shit was funny. It was not. Nothing coming out of King's mouth is funny whatsoever. He is outdated. He needs to go. Look away. Iron Saxton and Tom Phillips can handle commentary duty by themselves. Macdown has a two-man commentary booth. Monday Night Raw can have a two-man commentary booth. We don't need Jerry the King Lawler. His jokes aren't funny. They fall flat every single time. He is definitely not with the times. He doesn't know half the people who come up from NXT. It's just, it's time for the guy to go. He can go do his Dinner with the King podcast and leave the rest of the WWE commentary the two commentary booths that we have on Raw and SmackDown. NXT can keep its three-man booth, three-person booth because it just works down there. Austin, Akira has Theory in the robes. Akira with an octopus stretch, but with the strength of Austin Theory, he takes that octopus stretch, he pushes him up, and then he hits his version of the T T TKL called the A-T-L. Austin Theory, I don't know what the L was, but one, two, three, and Austin Theory is your winner. After the match, Angel Garza and Andrade come down. They do the Ingobernables salute, which is the, the, the fist in the air. You see, you see all other factions of the Ingobernables do this. People said it was like a shield type thing. No, the shield is down. Them putting their fist in the air is what the factions in Gobernables actually do. That is their sign. They put their fists in the air. And like they, you know. Then they beat up on Akira Tozawa, Garza, and 
theory put him in on the top rope. And then, and then Andrade comes over, puts the hammerlock on, and hits the hammerlock DDT down on these two, on, on Akira Tozawa. They look impressive. So, Vegas group looks impressive, and then we see Charlie Caruso with Rey Mysterio, who will be in a Money Bank ladder match, qualifying match next week. She asks, what would this mean to him? The only, like, one of the few things in WWE that has not happened or has eluded him is the Money in the Bank briefcase. Now, he says, he gives us a history lesson about 10 years ago, he was WWE, well, he was the World Heavyweight Champion. It was his second title reign. Two months after winning that title, he just, he barely could stand after his title, after his title defense when Kane's music hit. And he lost his Money in the Bank briefcase. I mean, he lost his world title because Kane beat him with the Money in the Bank briefcase. He says, no one knows better than he does what getting cash in on is. Which, for those, in, for those qualifying for the match on Raw, that is the case because none of these guys have been world champion of all, this, all the other guys in these qualifying matches. But I believe John Cena has the most cash-ins on. I could be wrong. With three, I think it's three. Yeah, I think it's three. I know it's at least two. But he, said he respects Murphy. He says he's going to be a great guy in the future. But this year, it's about me winning this match, going to Money in the Bank, and becoming Mr. Money in the Bank. And that is that. So Murphy vs. Rey Mysterio next week should be a hollow match. Seth Rollins again, staring out. Says, everyone needs... Uh, uh, Everyone needs something to have faith in. I want you to know, as he looks down in the camera now, I'm still here for you. The Messiah has truly risen. Then we had Angel Garza, who comes out with a rose in his mouth. He's going up against a Java, I didn't remember his name. Has a rose in his mouth, and I'm like, what is he doing? There's no fans here. But apparently, there was a really attractive girl, woman, holding a camera. As he walks over to her, hands her the flower, gives her a, chick, a kiss on the cheek, and then heads to the ring. I wonder what his fiance thinks about his character in, a, in WWE. So his opponent is someone from the PC class. Now, the only highlight of this match really was midway, like at the beginning of the match, this, this guy is going for something in the air, and, Andra, and Angel Garza kicks him like with this drop kick out of the midair. Looks beautiful. Then he flips his pants off, beats this guy down. Dua just loves himself. Hits the wing clipper at the end of the match. One, two, three. Angel goes to your winner. After the match, Theory and um, Andrade come down as well. They beat this guy down as well. Hammerlock DDT out of the corner, and that was that. So these guys just building up the dominance of this team and what they're going to do, and hopefully the coming weeks and months. Drew McIntyre talks to Charlie. She asks him what his thought, what's going on in his mind. And then he shows us his wrist, his arm, and points to the scar on his arm. That is there because of what happened in his match with, with Andrade three years ago at TakeOver War Games when he got hammerlocked, DDT'd, losing the WWE, the NXT Championship, having to miss six months of his career due to a torn bicep. He worked hard to get where he is, and he promises to claim more Andrade out of his boots. And if he has to miss six months because of it, so be it. Now that Jax is Kyrie Sane, I feel so bad for Kyrie Sane, as I said before, having to put this tub of lard over. And honestly, I'm not happy with the fact that they... I, I'm hoping Kyrie Sane's leaving because this, is, this has got to be humiliating, putting this piece of shit over. Nia Jax is unsafe, unprofessional, piece of shit, who does not deserve to be in the position she is in. I don't care if you're related to The Rock or not. There's at least twice in this match, it looks like she possibly could have given Kyrie Sane a concussion. And it's going to go unpunished because she's related to The Rock. They can't, they can't punish her because, they don't, because WWE feels if they punish Nia Jax, that'll look bad on them and The Rock won't want to work with them again. I'm like, oh, you want me to work with you? But look what you did to my cousin. 
It just looks so bad when she was throwing, when she threw Kyrie Sane around, and you see Kyrie Sane there holding her head as if this woman didn't have a concussion three, four months ago. So she hits the she hits her with a um Samoan drop, wins the match. Who cares? If Nia Jax wins the Money in the Bank ladder match, I don't know what the hell they're thinking because obviously that's why Becky Lynch kept this championship because having. Nia Jax beat a woman who held, has held the title for over a year is a big deal in their eyes. That'd be the biggest mistake of their life. Shayna Baszler should be your, your, your Raw Women's Champion, not Becky Lynch. I'm just saying. Charlotte Flair is here. The boy to death. She is the NXT Women's Champion, right? But this was Monday Night Raw. Why is she on Raw and not NXT? Why is she not cutting this promo that she was supposed to have tonight? On NXT. Now, I I couldn't listen to the entire promo because it's just so bad listening to Charlotte. But she opened this with a little history lesson of herself, of her own. She mentioned how she won the Royal Rumble, and how she had the right to face any champion she chose. But she mentions Bailey didn't make a challenge. Becky didn't make a challenge. But the next big thing Rhea Ripley did, um, Charlotte, that is not Becky or Bailey's job to challenge you to a championship opportunity. You won the Royal Rumble. Your job was to come out there and be like, I want to challenge this champion for their title at WrestleMania. It's not the other way around. Are you fucking stupid? Why is this woman coming here? And saying that, oh well, I wrestled Rhea Ripley and I'm NXT Women's Champion because Becky and Bailey didn't want to challenge me. That's not how it works. You win the Royal Rumble, you make a challenge. Drew McIntyre came out the night after wrestle after the Royal Rumble and said, I'm challenging Brock Lesnar. I won Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. That's how you make a challenge. That's how you get a match at WrestleMania. You don't wait for a champion to challenge you. You won the Royal Rumble. You come out whenever you feel like between Royal Rumble and WrestleMania and say, I want to challenge this champion. That's how it works. Then she, talk, then she talked a bunch of shit on Io Shirai and how she's and yada yada yada. I couldn't listen to this woman speak. She is so phony when she's with, with all this shit. Then we see how Alistair Black beat Bobby Lashley at PC Mania. And then we see the post talk, match of talk, and he questions if he needs a new manager or a new wife. Then we get to Lashley versus No Way Jose. This match was boring, pathetic, didn't need to happen. Basically, this match was put out there for Bobby Lashley to get so fed up with Lana that he would go out there and tell her to, why don't you just shut the hell up? And for a second, I was like, it's about time, time, this guy got some balls. So, he's out there, he's fighting with no way saying. She's like, finish him, finish him already, what are you doing, finish him. He has no way to down, he goes out there and he's like, why don't you just shut the hell up? So he goes back into the ring, fights him a little bit more, looks to set up for the spear. Lana's like, you can do it, Lashley, you can do it. He gets frustrated again, he looks at him and he's like, just be quiet. I got this. Just be quiet. No way, Jose. Almost like rolls him up from behind. Gets a two count. I would have died laughing if No Way Jose would have beaten Bobby Lashley. But he doesn't. Lashley picks him up, slams him down, gets into the corner, hits the spear. One, two, three. Lashley wins. The rift between these two continue. Obviously, the corruptions between Rusev and Lashley is never going to happen. So WWE is like, well, we can't really keep these guys married because in real life, they're not really married. So since that stuff's not going to happen, we're just going to have to do it a different way. I just hope it's sooner rather than later. That's again. For the final time, says to all non-believers, who left me no alternative. Tonight, I stomp out all the doubt. 
What does that mean? We'll tell you later. And then we get to the Viking Raiders versus Cedric Alexander and Ricochet. Boy, Ricochet and Cedric Alexander, it was really nice knowing you as a tag team that looked like they might give you a push. I will say, though, during the bulk of the majority of this match, Cedric Alexander and Ricochet took it to the Viking Raiders. They had them go out there and dominate this tag team. They were just going out there, keeping one Viking Raider in the corner. When um, Hanson tags in row, it didn't matter. The Ricochet and Cedric Alexander were still dominating them for the majority of the match. Unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. And in the end, Forrest Hammer, 1, 2, 3, the Viking Raiders are your winners. Maybe, just maybe, this means that this is not going to be the end of these guys. Maybe them losing because you don't always have to lose. You don't always have to win to, be, uh, to win a match, if you know what I'm saying. Having Ricochet and Cedric Alexander take the Viking Raiders to, the dis to, to their limits could possibly say better signs for these guys than just, hey, they got, they got their asses kicked for the most part. Now, maybe, just maybe, there's a chance that these two are going to be able to go out there and give you a hell of a match and be a good tag team and possibly be in the running for the tag team division. Or, this is the last time you'll see them do anything ever again and they'll be on main event from here on out. We'll just have to wait and see. I will say, though, that this being a live episode of Monday Night Raw, then being deemed essential now, we saw a lot more people this week than we have seen since this entire pandemic thing has started. So, but the fact that WWE does have such a big roster, and you want to keep this whole social distance thing going, and you want to keep people, like, you want to do something, you bring people in and out as you go. If you have... Rey Mysterio is not supposed to be there till the third hour. You don't have Rey Mysterio show up to the show to the um, building where he stays in his car or trailer or whatever the hell he's at till about 20 minutes before he's supposed to go out there. If Becky Lynch is in the first segment, as soon as she's done, she comes out, she gets in her car, and she leaves. Just to keep people, you know, so not everybody's there. Andrade versus Drew McIntyre, non-title match. Dang. I will say this. Drew McIntyre looks fantastic with that WWE championship around his waist. It looks like it belongs there. It looks like he should be, it should have had at least two or three title reigns since he's returned to the WWE. Now, Andrade, well, Zelina Vega comes up, talks trash. He's like, you're going to control her? Are you going to control her? He's like, he doesn't control me. Then, like, after everything settles down, Andrade with a slap to the chest of Drew McIntyre, and he just hits him with a headbutt, and he is just coming here. He comes in and says, I've been waiting three years for this. He has been waiting three years. Take the anger out on this guy. He is relentless. He is beating the piss out of Andrade during the beginning of this match. Kick to the gut. Unleash, um, three years of frustration. We get to the outside. He hits Andrade with a move. Andrade, um, Angel Guys, and Austin Theo, who are out there as well, they get Nate, they, they talk for a bit, he starts jawing at them, he's like, you guys want a part of this? Austin Theo says, we're, we're cool, we're cool, we know the rules. Cause allows Andrade to grab his, in his previously worked on arm, pulls him into the, t into the, ta into the ring post, and he starts working on that arm, trying to rip and tear that arm apart as he has before. Drew gets the upper hand again and just unleashes on Andrade. He has been wanting to beat the piss out of this guy for three years, costing him six months of his career. I bring this up all the time. The promo from What Culture Pro Wrestling, Drew Galloway cut on, on Joseph Connors. Just go back and watch that. It's up on YouTube. You can find it. And just the heart and the passion coming out of that guy's um, and the anger coming out of that guy's body on that night. Joseph Connors put him out for about 12 weeks with a um, righteous kill DDT. That the, the page turn, the, the rampage that you saw Nia Jax use last, last week, that was a righteous kill DDT. A guy using it who is 
about an inch or so shorter than Drew McIntyre using on a guy Drew McIntyre's size. And he landed him on his head and you just saw that Drew McIntyre, Drew Galloway at the time, almost, he cost him almost his career. If he would have got his hands on Drew, on Drew, Gal on, on Joseph Connors that night, he would do to him what he was doing to Andrade last night. He was just beating the piss out of this guy. He wanted him to suffer for causing him six months of his career. Now think, that was three years ago when he did that shit to just like when he cut that great promo, it was only a couple weeks, uh, a couple months afterwards. This guy holds a grudge until he gets to go out there and hurt somebody. He goes for the future, future shock DDT. But Andrade blocks that and hits the back elbow, which looked devastating. It, like, Andrade's back elbow, which is the same thing as the Judas effect, looks more devastating because it comes out of nowhere. He's not setting up for it. It just, it, he hits it in a flash, and it just looks so devastating. Now, Andrade is, is the referee is distracted. Andrade has him distracted. Austin Theory tries to pull Drew McIntyre's leg to keep him down. So Andrade comes out to Drew. Drew launches him into both men on the outside. Angel Garza and Austin Theory. Drew comes out and yells, Who grabbed my foot? Was it you? He grabs Austin Theory up. Hits him with the hardest chop of the night. Sending him flying. He gets him back in the ring. Goes up to the top. Vega distracts him. Drew gets hit down by Andrade. Andrade looks to go for the future for the um, Hammerlock DDT to re-injure. Drew McIntyre, how history repeat itself. Drew stops that. Drops Andrade, then hits the Alabama Slam. Does the three, two, one. Lay more kick. One, two, three. Drew McIntyre beats Andrade. After the match, though, burn it down. Layers over the over the um, PA system. That gets that allows. Angel goes to hit a chop block onto Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre is wobbling now. Just kicked by, by Seth Rollins as he runs into the ring. Stomp to Drew McIntyre. Then he walks over and stares down at the WWE Championship. Looks like he's going to leave, but Drew McIntyre looks like he's got life in him still, so he stomps him again. And the, and, and the, and the show goes off the air. Now, WWE's got to be out of their mind. Drew McIntyre, I'm sorry, not Drew McIntyre, but Seth Rollins lost to Kevin Owens at WrestleMania. However, you are going to award this guy with a WWE Championship opportunity? Why? What has he done? He lost to WrestleMania twice. He lost by DQ, and then he lost the, the, um, the no disqualification portion of that match at WrestleMania. Yes. He beat a jobber last week, a class, a, one of the performance center class people at, on Raw last week. But that deserved, he deserves a WWE Championship opportunity? They can't be serious. WWE, the only reason I, they would do this is because they want to get the Seth Rollins match out of the way so we can move on to a real challenger. Which, by the way, they don't have any. Austin Theory one day could be a challenger to Drew McIntyre. Angel Garza could one day be a challenger to Drew McIntyre. Even Andrade. Andrade, Austin, like, the entire um, group of Selena Vega could all be challengers to Drew McIntyre. But they're not there yet. They have nobody except for possibly Randy Orton outside of Seth Rollins if they want to go with Randy Orton. I mean, if they want to do a babyface versus babyface match, Ke um, Kevin Owens would be fine. I, but WWE just wants to do it. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't. I don't know. It's just. I just don't. I don't get what they're thinking. Drew McIntyre just won the title, and now you're going to put him against Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins, who. Should be nowhere near the world title picture. I guess we'll see what happens, but it's this is your Money in the Bank pay-per-view main event, isn't it? 
It's either going to be the Fiend and Braun Strowman or Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins. And this. here's the difference. Raw's WWE Championship match, you have one answer. Drew McIntyre beats the brakes off of Seth Rollins, while SmackDown, you have a, you booked yourself into a corner. We'll have to wait and see what they do. Monday Night Raw was not bad. I'm glad that we're past the years. Let's look at what happened 10 years ago. Well, what happened in 2008? What happened in 2015 in this match? It's back to just having wrestling matches that fucking matter and build towards something else. I think the reason they had to do that is because everybody was in a panic and now they're not as much of a panic when it comes to WWE. All I know is not a bad show. Still sucks that we have to have no fans in this thing. But it is what it is. They're making do with what they got. I'm fine with it. Hit that subscribe button. Comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at the France Club. Find me on twitch.tv slash the France Club. And find me on Instagram at the France Club. And I'll see you guys Thursday for AEW on TNT. That balls count. That, that open arena. That empty arena. No holes barred match should be something great with JR calling it. And I'm getting out of here. You guys have a good one.